The US Air Force has gone through a lot of aircraft in its history, with some coming and going within a few years, and yet others like the C-130 cargo plane, the A-10 Warthog, and the C-5 Galaxy which have been around for at least 40 years, and in the case of AC-130 for 64 years. But none are likely to outlast the B-52. So, what makes the B-52 so different that it should be kept going for so long? Why would they still use the same aircraft? That was active in the Cuban Missile Crisis of 1962, the Vietnam War, then, through both Iraq Wars, Afghanistan and, more recently, against ISIS. When we look at the Boeing B-52 Straya Fortress, the last ones were built in 1962, 58 years ago. At that age, you would think they would have been retired long ago. But with ongoing upgrades, they could be in service till 2040 at a minimum, and even pushing into the 2050s and possibly beyond. That's a hundred years old. So, why would they keep them in service for that long? And how are they going to make a very analog aircraft, relevant in the era of digital warfare? Step into the cockpit of a B-52, and you're stepping into a 1960s aircraft, which, flies like a 1960s aircraft, and yet, it's still here. But it wasn't meant to be this way. It was due to retire in 1996, which slid to 2000, then 2003 and eventually ended up at 2040, and now it's 2050 and may go even further into the future. Part of the reason is that, it can still do the job it was designed for, exceptionally well. To drop bombs, lots of them, of every type that is available to the US arsenal, and to do it almost anywhere air defense is allowing. Updating the B-52 will be expensive, but nowhere near what developing a new aircraft would be. But of course you will still have a 1960s aircraft, but with lots of new electronics and engines. The thing is, no one has ever kept a frontline combat aircraft in service. For what could be at least 80 years, and is more likely to be 100 years. Even so, there have been a lot of changes over the years, since the last B-52s were built. It started out as a frontline high-altitude nuclear bomber, but, as air defenses improved in the Soviet Union, it took on roles more suited to its capabilities, and where the air defenses were less sophisticated. But the days of carpet bombing like in Vietnam, and gravity drop nuclear weapons is over now, it's more about using standoff weapons, like cruise missiles at a distance, or where more direct bombing allows precision guided ordnance is used. There are also on any given day, more B-52s available for immediate action than B-1s or B-2s. Giving up the B-52 would greatly lessen the long-range bombing capabilities of the U.S. Air Force, something which has diminished a lot since the end of the Cold War. They've even brought back ones from the Boneyard, to replace badly damaged or crashed ones in recent years. The B-52's huge fuel capacity, not only gives it a very long range of over 14,000 kilometers, carrying 35 tons of bombs and one tank full. It can also be refueled in the air, giving it an almost unlimited range. Another more pressing reason is that its eventual replacement, the B-21 Raider, is not expected to reach its initial operating capability until at least 2030. Barring technical issues and cost implications, which plagued earlier programs like the B-2 and the F-35. And on the issue of cost, the B-52 was bought and paid for a long time ago, with the last B-52s being built in 1962. And those worked out at about $88 million each in today's money. Compare that to the B-21 Raider. Each one of those will cost in the region of $550 million, with the total program cost, including R&D at $97 billion, for what is believed to be about 135 aircraft. But the final number has yet to be determined.
The engines it uses are the Pratt & Whitney TF33. Eight are used on each B-52. Two of which are placed together in four engine mounts, two on each wing. These were developed in 1958 and manufactured up until 1985, with over 8,000 being produced. The 744 B-52s accounting for nearly 6,000 of them. But since then, engine technology has improved greatly, becoming more powerful and more efficient. So continuing to use 1950s tech engines is keeping the cost of running the B-52 high, in both maintenance and fuel. One of the problems about fitting newer, more powerful engines is that, it could create damaging stress on the wings and the airframes, but would not show up until after they were fitted. There were no 3D computer models or stress simulators back in the 1950s, and even now it's a difficult engineering balancing act to pull off. Matching the TF-33s closely in weight and size and still giving improved performance in economy without causing the wings to fall off. Replacing the engines and the wings together would push up costs dramatically. There have been several attempts to re-engine the surviving aircraft as early as the mid-70s. Boeing looked at replacing the engines and the wings. In 1982 Pratt & Whitney suggested replacing them with the PW2000 engines. In 1996, Rolls-Royce proposed fitting them with RB211535s on a lease purchase scheme, but that was rejected because the US Air Force was against leasing combat assets. In 2003 and after the cost of maintaining the TF-33s had tripled. In a decade a $4.7 billion refitting program was looked at again with a proposed competition between Rolls-Royce RB211, the Pratt & Whitney PW2000, and the CFM56, it was suggested that whichever engine was chosen, a cost saving of between 11 and 15 billion dollars could be achieved and the B-52's range would be increased by 22 and flight times could be tripled. But this also went by the wayside in 2018, yet another engine refit program called the Commercial Engine Re-Engining Program or CERP, was proposed and as of April 2020 Pratt and & Whitney and Rolls-Royce were tasked with producing plans for supplying 608 new digital engines with service and spare support until 2050. Another reason why the B-52 is still here is the design of the aircraft itself, which has been described as both being over-engineered and yet under-engineered. At the same time, even 60 years later, the condition of a remaining 76 aircraft's overall structure has stood the test of time in terms of the airframe itself. It's over-engineered, all the planes still in service, which are the later GMH variants, still use. The original airframe to a similar extent, the flight controls like the yokes, the seats, the wings, the flight control surfaces, the linkages and the tail assembly are all the same as when they rolled out of a factory back in 1962. Obviously, they are well looked after with regular maintenance and any repairs are done as deemed necessary, but there is also a lot of original 1950s design parts still there. A testament to the designers to make something that would last. However, this is also a problem when it comes to sourcing parts, which have not been made for 60 years. So visits to the boneyard and previously scrapped B-52s are a common occurrence. So what about the under-engineering? Well, many planes are designed to make use of all the space available and often designed with specific equipment in mind, sometimes which has been specially created for that aircraft. In this case, although the B-52 might be cramped and uncomfortable for the crews, it had enough space and flexibility to allow for equipment updates. The B-52 was designed and built when the world was analog and computers took up the size of a room. Since then, the electronics have shrunk in size dramatically and the power of computers increased exponentially. Over time, upgrades have been proposed when the General Dynamics Grumman EF-111 Raven Electronic Warfare aircraft was retired in 1998. 16 were to be modified to give them additional electronic jamming capabilities, but the program was then cancelled in 2005, then revived in 2007 and then cut again in 2009, all down to costs. 
In 2013, the Air Force began a fleet-wide upgrade program called the Combat Network, Communications Technology or Connect to give the existing B-52s communication computing and avionics. The first major upgrade in this area since they were built, the cost of the Connect program is $1.1 billion, and funding has been secured for 30 aircraft with 10 per years being upgraded. A new Raytheon active electronically scanned array radar is also being proposed. Similar to that used by aircraft like the F-35, giving an improved range and detecting a greater number of targets, tests could start with this in 2023. The weapon systems are also in for an update to allow it to carry some of the Air Force's most advanced ammunitions, with tests already being carried out with the hypersonic AGM-183 air-launched rapid response weapon and the AGM-86B long-range standoff missile, which could carry conventional or nuclear warheads. The conventional internal rotary launcher will also be upgraded to carry double the number of weapons and electronic countermeasures are looking like they might be upgraded to keep in line with other aircraft. But because it is considered to be a standoff platform and they would not be entering high threat areas. As it looks likely, the B-52 will probably be in service for maybe a hundred years. That will be pretty amazing news to the original designers and engineers and for the generations to come, it will be a symbol of great engineering.